Hello everyone, welcome um, to another live stream, a slightly more well-lit one this time. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, apologies about the angle because the Mac's only temporarily going to be in this position today if we're doing things a bit differently. Hopefully these guys are going to be quiet for this thing. Probably no guarantees of that. It's probably a silly time we do it of the day, but it's not the only time that we get like most people can attend, you know, it's sort of a, a, a happy medium for you guys elsewhere in the world and for us in the UK. So, you know, we can't do it too late, can't do it too early. So it's where we're stuck. I hope everyone's doing well. Um, hello to everyone who's joined, Dara, Sandra, MT, um, Klaus, Lesser more Vulture, and welcome everyone. Um, today is just going to be a more of an interesting session. I'm going to be doing some live training with the boys, tidying up, because people keep asking for it. So instead of the usual, I'm going to talk for about five minutes, then we're going to get them straight out, and I'm going to do some training with them on the table for tidying up. So you can just see it happening and what we do. We don't get to do it as often, because there's so many other husbandry things need to be trained. But, you know, what can you do? And hello, Mr. Tini. And as usual, they begin. Um, lovely. Um, so, yeah, so what's been going on? Um, I finished my Susan Friedman course, uh, passed that, which was great. So that's a bit more knowledge. Uh, another bit of another qualification, lovely, uh, to have under my belt. Um, we're doing an exam, certification exam soon, where we will sort of like be um, basically becoming certified bird trainers worldwide if we pass it. We're not going to tell you when that is because just in case, you know, it's going to be a difficult one. So hopefully we pass it, but we'll be taking it again. Um, we filmed a course, which we'll be putting up on the website soon, about how to build a, a good and stable bond with your bird. Uh, we'll obviously let you guys know when that goes up. If you're a channel member or a patron, you'll get a discount on that. If you're a top tier patron, I know some of you watch this, you'll be getting it for free. Everyone else, it'll just be a reasonable amount just so it justifies how much we, effort we put into it. It's an hour and 15 minutes as well, of course, so it's much longer than the sort of original version we did for um, Jason's sort of um, conference. So hopefully there'll be a lot more value in there. And we tried to put a lot more value uh, of information about basically what we learned recently and try to flesh it out make it as much as interesting as possible and as useful to as broad an audience as possible not just beginners not just advanced people but for everyone hopefully it'll be a useful watch so anyway when that's out i'll put it all over socials and you guys will be notified about it uh the flock are generally doing well if you're on patreon again you probably heard that me and kipling had a falling out recently and i don't mean like i did anything horrible to him we, he kind of did something horrible to me a while back and the bond is difficult to rebuild it's something i'm going to talk about a bit today later on me and charlie are getting on very well uh, recalling to the bare hand, and that's really good because it said progress with Charlie was initially quite slow. So that's really good to see. The rest of the flock are doing okay. Just use yourselves, really. Chip had a night fright uh, a couple of nights past, which was a bit scary for him. He's got a minor sort of graze on the edge of his nair, but otherwise they're fine. It's just one of those things with some cockatiels. Um, some don't have night frights at all. Others um, have them very frequently. Others, like ours, just have them occasionally, but they're still not exactly the ideal thing, not very fun. And I do have a video on night frights and why cockatiels have them, what you can do to prevent them on the channel. A bit of an older one, but still valid today. So, um, yeah, that's basically my sort of um, intro. So what we'll do is we'll get the boys out and then I'll turn, hopefully turn the max so you can see it and uh, do some training with them. Then I'll move to my usual spot on the table so it'll look a bit nicer and um, have the Mac elevated so you're not just looking me looking down on the screen at you. So give me one second, I'm just going to get them out and we'll get started. So I thought it'd be a bit different just to do some training right at the start rather than in the middle. Hopefully it's going to go well. So give me one moment. Come on in. Are you ready? Can we do some training? Are we going to be naughty? Probably going to be naughty because, let's face it, it's, it's the usual, isn't it? Right, do we know what we're doing? Fish Fish is going to explore my desk to see if Chip's interested. So you can actually see him do it as well. Give me a nibble just to get you started. Almost, and try again. It's been a little while since we've done this, so it may take a little while to get him warmed up. Good boy. Aren't oh, you smart? Turn that so everyone can see. Good boy. Normally I'd reinforce him after he's done it a few times, but just to start him off, I'll do it. Oh, what fish, fish is going to join him? Do it again. Do it again. We need one more out of you. What a smart man. But you fish fish, you can start as well. Fish fish knows his behaviour too. He's learned it from Chip and he knows exactly what to do. He's just a bit lazy with it generally. Get some more reinforcement. 
what I'll do as well is after we've, I've shown you it, I'll like, I know some of you are probably curious how I train this and what's involved in it. I do have a video on it as well, by the way, but um, it's not that involved, honestly. It just takes a bit of shaping and a bit of chaining, which I'll probably define as well. Do it again. Good boys. It's probably one of my favorite behaviors for them. I know for some people it's not very impressive, but I really like it. I think it's really cute. Just the way they just they constantly offer it, self reinforce. Are you going to try and give it to me? Are you fetching it to me? Oh, you smart boy. You're so clever. What's it in there? Oops. <laughs> Fish also has a habit of stealing a whole bud where he can. He'll just, just steal the whole bud and he'll just take it away. And again. And again. One more time. Good boy. They even sort of differentiate where to put the items as well. Fish knows generally, a uh, chip knows generally the bottles go in the vending machine, whereas other items will go in the bins. I was going to work on colour differentiation uh, between them, so no certain things go in certain colour things. But honestly, it's just not enough time. I, I would love to train that. You can give it to me. This just goes in the vending machine. It doesn't go to me. You can see how much mess you I just probably can't see it. There's a lot of mess on the table now as well. Fish, fish, the bottle, please. <laughs> That's not quite where I wanted that. Okay, I'll do this for another minute or so because I know I don't know if it's gonna be boring for you guys, and I'll stop, and then we'll sort of turn around and talk a little bit about it while they play. Good boy. But yeah, I know um, a few people, a few of you are asking about this and just seeing it live, so I thought I'd find a way to set it up for you guys to see it. Yeah, it's just a lot of fun. The wine bottle going there now, or is I'm not really, I don't know if you have to say that these days. The juice bottle, juice bottle going in there. Can we do, do maybe one or two more for me in there? I don't want it, I don't want it, I want it in here. I want it in there. Good boy, go <laughs> fish, fish. I think we're approaching satiation with you guys as well now. You're probably getting a bit full and you're probably going to start being silly in a minute. And normally afterwards as well with these sessions, I'll just let them play with the stuff. Let them play with it. Let them throw them around and just enjoy. But obviously today it's a bit different because it's on. It's all for show, isn't it? Okay, let's clean it up. I'll put, let's put these all in here because it's going to be quicker to clean up. And we can use them in the bins next time. Off you go. There we go. Let me pop this. Let me just set myself up on my usual spot and then we'll resume live streaming service. Uh, where's my box? I'm in the hallway, didn't I? That's silly of me. Great live stream, mate, guys. You're not even uh, seeing me for most of it. All right. We are back in our usual spot. We have just done, finished our tidying up. Hello, everyone who's just joined. Let me just say hello. Uh, have I missed anyone? Hi, Parrots on Wheels. Hello, Mr. Teeny, if I didn't say hello. Hello, you hang up, hang up, pal. Hello, Carol. Hello, Teal Friend. Yeah, I mean, their feathers are in generally very good condition. I think most of our Parrots' feathers are in good condition. Um, we have a little bit of bronzing on Scampy because he likes getting kissed and he likes crawling where he shouldn't do. Otherwise, they're all doing very well. Um, we try to give him the best diet possible. Hello, Laura, as well. I have a soft spot for Cockles Heels, Alicia. They're probably my favourite um, type of parrot, honestly. I really love them. They're adorable. So um, if you've just joined, hello. I was just doing some um, live tidy up training with the, bir with the birds, the boys. And if you're interested in how you do that, it's a very simple process. The very first thing you want to do is just introduce them to the object, let them get used to it, then get them to approach the object in return for some positive reinforcement treat. After that, you start to sort of start to shape the behavior you want. So you get them to interact with it, maybe interact with little things. And just because the way animals work and because animals will experiment, they will try different actions to try and get consequences, you will naturally see them offering different things. For example, Chip started picking up the bottles. So I was like, I reward for that. Then I slowly shaped it. So that sort of molded his behavior in very small steps. So he picked up the bottle and he moved it towards the vending machine, got a reward for that. And then eventually he popped in, got a big reward, a lot of fuss, and then it became more consistent. It's very much the same for all of these sorts of training methods. And you can also chain things as well. That's why I just talk about shaping. So creating a behavior, one behavior in very small steps, although there's an argument between that they're both the same thing, but I'm not gonna bore you that. Chaining the separate behaviors, which you then link together uh, with sort of separate cues and prompts, 
and then rewards and then you just basically make it one complete behavior later but yeah it's I don't know if that made that sound as simple as it actually is. It isn't that hard to do. And if you, if you have any questions, just let me know. Uh, happy to answer them. And obviously, there is a video where I talk about it in much more detail where, um, you know, I'll show you the process and I'll show you examples of each step. Because I think I used, in the original video, I think I used this weird acrylic um, standy where they had to put shapes on it. And then I have a newer version where they were kind of already decent to it. But yeah, just thought I'd get that done. Thought you'd enjoy it. So, Paula, I'm getting... Oh, also, as usual, guys, any questions, happy to answer them. Sophie's in the chat as well. Um, I'll either deal with them immediately or I'll deal with them after I finish whatever topic and we'll have the usual sort of Q&A right at the end. Um, so, Paula asked, what colour what, what color do I recommend? It, it doesn't matter. They're all amazing. I mean, we've got Chibi who's pied and we've got Fish Fish, who's a traditional sort of grey. I think all cockatiels are adorable. Um, you know, it's most down to their personality, isn't it? Because they're such intelligent, um, funny creatures. So I don't think it matters. Yeah, just like Alicia said, personality is most important. I think I, I sort of generally have that theme for most things. Uh, Alicia, I have took on 11-year-old cockatiel and he has such a fear of hands. Could I do target training for him to come out of the case? Yes, 100% target training, you know, it's really useful because it takes it takes hands out of the equation because you've got that, that stick between you and the hand. And also that stick becomes an extension of the hand. So it's in the cage is great, it's protected contact. Um, it gives your cockatiel a sense of safety. Yeah, once they associate behavior, you can give them plenty of positive reinforcement, even if you have to deliver it into a bowl after they target or if they'll take it from your hand in the cage, it's great. And you can start getting them used to hands in that way. You know, it's all about building a positive association with your hand and letting them know that your hand isn't going to grab them. Once they're a bit happy with it, there's another thing you can try. It's one of the only old school techniques I kind of still think are okay. And that's popping your hand in the cage and leaving it flat and completely still with a bit of millet uh, pinch between it. That's really useful. Another thing that a lot of people do is they'll, um, if you're taking from the through the bars, it doesn't really matter, but a lot of people will sort of extend their hand and then um, you can't even see I'll extend that. Imagine my hand's extended and then pinch the treat there and have a bit of distance. You can also take your hand out of the equation entirely. So you can sleeve it, sleeve your hand, uh, put a perch in your sleeved hand if you want to step up on your sleeved hand and get him used to the training game that way. So he try this is how we do with Olive, by the way. Um, she gets used to stepping up on the perch then you phase out the perch over time, then it's just sleeve hand, and then it's your bare hand, and that's a good way of doing it. There's loads of ways you can approach it, uh, but target training is such a useful uh, tool. That's why all sorts of people recommend it. It's just really good. So if there's any other questions before I do the first topic of the day. I think I've caught up with questions. There's only been a couple of questions. Um, Dara, I love target training, especially with Horus. He likes to fuss about going back to his cage, some sort of target anyway to get him. Yeah, it, make, it gives your bird a choice. Why would you want to force your bird into the cage or sort of like have to hassle them when you can just target them in? It's what worked with Scampi. And then another thing we recommend is something we call a peaking perch. You just put a perch on the inside door, heavily reinforce it while they're in and outside the cage, and then they'll step onto that perch and give them a reward because that perch is really reinforcing. Great. Can you just see Chip's little head and his little eye peeking, peering between Fish's body and my hood there? He's just watching... Probably very displeased. Well, of course, Laura, he will go on your hands and move him about on his terms uh, because th that's his terms. You know, he will want to be moved when he wants to, but you have to give him some incentive. Um, and because he's obviously been mistreated in the past, he's not going to want to be touched. He's, he, those hands to him are the worst. So it's going to be about getting used to those hands. I think it's much a very similar situation to what Alicia was talking about as well, although in obviously a different sort of context, different individual circumstances. You need to get him used to those hands, build positive relationships with the hands, make sure that he knows that that hand isn't going to be like clasping around him. My boys trust my hands, you know. They will tell me when they don't want to do something, and I will try and respect that as long as it's not a dangerous thing. But they, they're they free to tell me. And sometimes they'll give me the uh, the cockatiel. I call it the cockatiel uh, frenzy. They'll just like um, beak my hand very gently to tell me no. It's like, okay, then I'll just say no. I'll just step away. Uh, that's another thing you can do as well if you've got a biting problem. Uh, reinforce precursors, a technical way of saying basically reinforce the action they show you before they go to bite you. So I've used this a lot in consults recently. If your um, bird bites, say, for example, you approach your bird and they back away, and then you continue approaching your bird where they bite you, they're going to bite you. If you back away, when they back away, then they're going to back away more in the future rather than go to bite you. And that's a really useful uh, technique for sort of like building trust as well because they will learn that all they have to do is just give you a sign and you won't push them to that boundary now with some rescues that's more difficult because if they've not been respected in the past that boundary is going to be very slim and they'll just go straight for you but it is a very useful technique well 
Well, Paul, I mean, if, if you're happy with all of them, you know, pick whichever one you like to look of, which one which one appeals to you, you know, the colours is entirely up to you. Like Adara said, there's no real advice. Um, and Jennifer, any advice on training? Oh, there's lots of questions today, so I'll, I'll do Jennifer's question and I'll go back to any more after this. Um, any advice on training adult cockatiels never interacted closely with human before? Uh, take it very slow. Um, be consistent with it and start with targeting probably as well. Because if um, the hand's scary, if you can just get him interacting with the, the stick, that's going to be a good start. You can use the, just drop it, having a, a sort of treat perch or treat bowl to drop it, drop his reinforcement in if he's scared of hands. Uh, very small steps. It's basically the same stuff though. A lot of these things, um, it's the same approach, just adapted to your individual bird. They're sort of like, I don't want to call them templates, but there's certain approaches that are proven to work that use and then they do um so just because it's uh, an older bird doesn't necessarily mean that training will be any different it just has to be approached in a slightly different way that's probably a contradiction never mind so uh, if there's any more you need to hear about that just let me know again i'll talk about it a bit more um so we did our live training we've done our thing so i want to talk about topics and some of this may apply to what you guys are talking about uh, right now um so I want to talk about time scales uh, when it comes to training, when it comes to bonding, and when it comes to expectations. I know I've touched this before, but I felt it was worth revisiting because it's come up a lot in questions on my channel. It's come up an awful lot in consultations recently. People are, we're obsessed with time scales. We want to know how long something's going to take. We want to know that something's going to be solved quickly often in time. And we can't apply that type, those time scales to our birds because they've got their own time scales and they're not going to work on ours just because we expect them to. I was talking to someone who has an Amazon rescue and when you go on certain other channels, which propagate a, a quick fix mentality where like you can't fix the bird quickly, shoot it on. This person has been working on this rescue Amazon for years and for many times it's months to achieve even the smallest results. And that is the time scale. Sometimes you have to be prepared for if you've got a rescue, if you've got a normal uh, bird who just isn't a rescue, for example, but is not tame or if there are tame, sometimes that time scale can be very long. It's not something you can really predict. Sometimes bonding will happen really quickly. Uh, sometimes, I don't I'll talk about taming in a second. Sometimes bonding will happen really quickly. Sometimes training will happen really quickly. Sometimes there'll be roadblocks. It is how long is a piece of string. So I, I like, implore anyone who um, sort of watches my channel or thinks about timescales to just be like, okay, I've got my expectations. That's fine. But they may not be met. I may have to do work for longer with my birds. I may have to put more effort in. And I'm going to have to be prepared for a long commitment to even the most simplest of training methods. It varies massively. Do you want to come here as well? You seem to be lonely there. Just going to have a shoulder. Sorry, yeah. Um, so there is no time to set time scale. Sometimes bonding, sometimes work for even the smallest of things can take years. And Kipling's a good example of that. You know, you'd think with all the progress we made of Kipling, it'd be all solved. No, it's not, because there's so much um, stuff to work on there. You know, so much backstory, so much stuff. And we have to commit to that. Now, taming, I want to talk about taming. So I hear the word taming an awful lot. Um, and I, I used to use the word taming. I don't really like the word anymore because taming implies like you're gaining control of your bird. You're doing something to them to make them more compliant. And I suppose bonding, this, the result is the same. They become more thing. But we we tend to use taming as a label. If a bird's calm, if a bird's relaxed around us, it's displaying a multitude of behaviours that we like to see. We call it tame. Paul and Panda, you have to wait, I'm afraid. Um, I don't, I can't quickly respond, you know, I'm, I'm, it's a live stream. So I'll get back to your question a little bit. So um, with regards to like bonding and taming, taming is just a label. It's just labeled to describe certain behaviors and certain ways our behaviors, our birds will behave towards us. So it's really important to see it as building a relationship. You're building a relationship with your bird. It's like when you build a relationship with a human. I'm not, I didn't tame Sophie. Just because Sophie displays behaviours I like to see, like giving me gifts or being nice around me, you know, kissing me. I didn't tame Sophie. So why do we not use the same language with humans as we do with birds? We're both, they're both animals. We're both building a relationship. So it's, you know, it's very important to remember you're building a relationship. And that can sometimes set you up for more success because you're not going to go on the internet and be like, all right, to tame my bird, I have to do X, Y, and Z in X, Y, and Z time. I just have to do what I have to do and I can observe my individual bird and that's what's a good relationship. And, you know, bribery is fine when you're building a relationship, you know, bribe Sophie with pizza, bribe the birds with millet, you know, that is how you build a positive relationship. I, I, I can't remember where I read it. It's something about you define a friendship or a positive relationship by how much positive reinforcement has been put into that relationship. Uh, you can have negative relationships as well, obviously, but then you don't want that, do you? 
So it is about building positive relationships rather than just taming your bird. And when you, when I hear taming, it's often paired with stuff like I'm going to push my. What you, are you preening me? I was only mean to take off your preening me. You can go up there if you want. You don't want to be there. Uh, paired with stuff like I am taming them because I'm asserting my my will on them. Again, it doesn't really work that way. If you want the usual advice I give to anyone, if you want to have bonding success, training success, you want to shorten that time scale as much as possible. It's going to be all down to consistency and effort over that time. You need to be consistent. You need to put in that effort and that will pay the results. If, even if you say, for example, you've got a bird and you can only work with them for a couple of minutes a day. If you're consistent with that every single day, it's probably going to pay more dividends than putting an hour's work on one day because the rest of that time, that bird's not learning anything, not having interaction. So do be consistent and do take some effort over time. So let's have a look at the questions as well that people have asked. So I know someone's very um, keen to respond to my question. So what I do with these, these, these live streams, if anyone's not familiar, I will have a topic and I will catch up on the question. Sometimes other people in the chat will help out, but um, I can't like answer instantly, especially if I'm in the middle of talking about a topic or talking about other people. Uh, where are we? Yeah, parrots on wheels stationing is an amazing um, behavior to teach. It's so useful for going back in the cage. Scampi basically knows how to do that. I think I talked about Jennifer's about. Um... So my baby cockatiel uh, doesn't ever fly, even though he knows how to fly. Maybe you need to train him. Maybe you need to. Maybe he's training you to take him where he wants to go whenever he wants to do it. If you, for example, fish is quite lazy when it comes to flying. So if he wants to go somewhere, he will try and get me to take him first. I'll be like, okay, you can just do it. It's, it's almost like babying our birds. You know, sometimes we have to let them fly and be birds and do their own thing. And you can encourage him to fly through training, you know, uh, get him to hop to you, reinforce him for flying, make flying worthwhile because it's a high energy activity flying. And if our birds aren't used to it and don't really want to or only do it when they're scared, why would they bother? You know, even <laughs> it's like us humans, we have legs, we could run, but most of us don't. We don't bother. We only do it when we have to. So we need to make it fun. Like when we go for a job or, you know, you listen to music to make it fun, make it fun for your bird. Give it reinforcement at the end. Reinforce myself for a run um, with a, a top chocolate bar at the end of it. Probably negates any benefit of it, but yeah. Uh, Adara, yeah, if there's a clipping that um, has an impact, I don't know if there was a bird clipped or not in that uh, example, but clipping is a bad thing. Also, Paul says it wasn't clipped. Yes, yeah, so just um, encourage him, make it worth his while, find out his favorite treats and encourage him to fly. So Jonas, hello, recently got a hand raised young green cheek and he's okay stepping up when he's inside the cage. When he's outside the cage, he doesn't want to go near our hands and it's really hard to get back into the cage. So uh, the thing I mentioned before about the peaking perch would be very useful, having that inside door perch and you do this in the cage. So you put that per door perch in there and you give him reinforcement treats constantly on that perch. So whenever you're on that perch, give him treats, make it really great in, in the cage for nothing. Then do your training on that perch as well. Then um, get him out, pop him back on that perch, reinforce him, shut the door, get him used to that. And also it's possible that he's just nervous outside the cage. He's a bit worried. Um, there may be other factors uh, that are impacting his behavior. I mean, there's a bit more, probably a lot to investigate here. My advice, we set up that peaking perch, get targeting going, make sure you know his favorite treats, make going back into the cage lots of fun. If hands are a big issue, sleeve them, use perches to get that um, training game going, then try your hands. Um, is there anything else outside the cage? Is it only when you're putting him back in at the end of his outing that he does this? Is it, only, is it something else around him? Has someone tried to grab him? There's a lot more that could be there. So it's, it's beyond the advice of this game. It's a bit difficult. So, Jennifer, he's very treat motivated. That's a great way to start. And, you know, <laughs> the best way to uh, work on any fears is consistency. There's obviously um, desensitization, which can be done through positive reinforcement, through negative reinforcement. And there's counter conditioning. You know, you can make the scary things less scary by giving him strong rewards for going near them. They become less scary because they've been positively associated with something good. So, you know, it's all useful techniques. You notice that I, I do study this a lot more because I use all the jargon now. I try not to use the jargon, but I can't. It just slips out. Um, so, Jonas, if he hangs upside down in the roof of his cage, that's something pickles does. Sometimes they do it for fun. Um, they're natural canopy feeders, so they all hang upside down from branches to reach things. If he's screaming... He could be seeing something that's scary, or he could be screaming for attention. Again, it's a bit difficult to know without context. So, Dara, this is why I'm a fan of the doctor shop responsibly because rescues will not thrive in every ho household. Yes, they won't. They, what are you doing, Chip? You're barking. They will not thrive in every single household. Um, I always in, like push everyone strongly to, if you're considering getting a rescue, 
be prepared for it. And if you're prepared, then great, go for it. Um, you know, sometimes it's better um, to just get a bird. If you're if you're a new owner, maybe it's better to get it from a breeder or a shop, a pro, as long as they're ethical and they're responsible. And a lot of people give us flack for saying that. I'm like, well, why? Why would you want that either bird to suffer when they could have a much light, better life if that person's getting the right bird for them? Uh, diet and so, so Clay, Clay Gill, sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. Anyone working with a new bird, get your diet and sleep down first and make sure they're getting 12 hours. So th those are good, very good points. One thing I would um, mention is diet is really important, as is sleep, as is a bit of routine. Um, and more diet, the better the diet, the better the... The better the diet, they're going to come out in a second, I think, after they stop screaming, because there's no reward for screaming. Um, who's doing it now? Is it Louis? Louis. Right, anyway, sorry. Um, get the diet down first, it's good advice. However, you all do want to be doing your bonding work, you do want to be doing your training work at the same time. Um, I've seen very, ex well, I wouldn't even call them very experienced trainers, trainers who are supposed to have a lot of knowledge make this mistake and fixate on diet and then fall very short on everything else. And if you fixate too much on diet, you're not doing everything you need to, you, you need to be doing with that new bird. Here comes a screaming. Uh, where, I don't know why it scrolls all the way to the bottom when I try and scroll it. Yeah, it's, it's true, Clay uh, Yeah, I think, I mean, Paul, Dara's got some good advice here. I don't really need to say much more, to be honest. She's saying a lot of good stuff. So, Cindy, that's a really good question. I think you've asked me that. Um, I think you were sort of asking on my um, comments recently. So you can have a male and female pair. There's nothing wrong with having that. A lot of people successfully do it. The pitfalls that people fall into with having a male-female pairing is when they encourage hormonal behavior and when they don't manage hormonal behavior. And, like, a lot of the times people ask me, like, you can't have a male and female. I've told that. It's not allowed. We have male-female pairings here, and there's no there, – occasionally we get hormonal spikes. We've not had any breeding behavior, and we've not had any eggs in years. And I'm quite proud of that because we don't want to encourage it here. It's not good for them. Um, so – if you look after the hormones, and there will be spikes, you look after the hormones, you avoid those nesting sites. Blooming heck. I was going to swear there because it's really hard to focus when uh, they're screaming continuously like that. This is what it's like in reality of, of having birds sometimes. Um, if you manage those um, behaviours, it's fine. It's completely fine. And there'll be a, you'll be able to have two birds at the same time uh, with opposite genders with no issues. Jennifer, yeah, flight training is a great way to teach and uh, associate with a reward. Always worth it. Uh, Dara again um, to the rescue. She's like our little um, answering, answering machine. Dara, you and Mr. Teeny on um, Discord are very, very helpful to us um, when it's sort of normal questions. I mean, these two would rather hang out on me than fly. It's like we do encourage them. We do formal training with them because they need to exercise and it's good for them. And when they do get into it, they really enjoy it. Am I Australian? Is that, yeah, yes, I'm British. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't mind being Australian, to be honest. I, I kind of prefer Australia to Britain. So it's a shame I'm not um, Australian, honestly. I like, I like Australia. It's good. Sorry, uh, it's completely silent. I, I'm completely silent now. Do you think Yuki is a nice name for a cockle? So, yeah, it's a cute name. It's an like anime sort of themed name, isn't it? Uh, to be honest, I like them being noisy um, to an extent because it's natural for parrots to be noisy. It's when, obviously, it's, it's normal. If you're trying to do work, you, you want to be able to hear yourself think, and it can be very distracting. I think Charlie and Louis are the biggest culprits for being noisy. Olive sometimes. It's really, um, like... And I'll, I'll just be honest, it's really annoying, but it's the reality of them, and we have to be accept that and uh, work on it. So, you know, a lot of the time they are quiet. I, I, it doesn't really portray it very well on these live streams. They are quiet a lot of the time, but when we go on these live streams, it just seems to make them scream, and it's quite um, annoying for us because we want to portray a good image for ourselves, but, you know, at least we're portraying reality. So there we go. Yeah, Sandra, you love the chaos, don't you? You're, you're here just to, to see things go wrong and to scream. The, my, at least my training sex, um, session went well, you know. Uh, it's decent time for these guys to go yeah. in a second, isn't it? Boy, these guys have been really good, haven't they? So, such good boys. So quiet. Do their training really well. That was, that was chip. 
So uh, let's talk. Let's talk about Laura's question. Then we'll sort of play a little bit with the other coins. Then do the rest of the topics and then the usual yeah. chaos. So Laura, my twelve-week-old conya screams when I touch them, and their wing flaps out at the same time, but they don't bite or seem upset. Is that a normal behaviour? They could be startled by you touching them. I mean, how are you touching them? Are you doing it for husbandry purposes? Are you just touching them for the sake of it? Um, my conyers, well, people in the scampies don't care anymore. They're happy with me touching them, but they know I don't touch them inappropriately or for randomly. I will dry kiss them. I will touch their wings when I need to look at them. But, you know, sometimes he just doesn't like it, maybe. Sometimes you have to teach your birds to be okay with being touched. You need to reinforce it. And you need to give them, again, the ability to say no to being touched. Okay. They're not out yet. I, didn't know if you I thought you were getting them out. I thought you were getting them out. <laughs> Uh, yeah, sometimes she has to do that. Stay. I don't know why she's staying out of shot. It's no reason not to. But yeah, um, it's okay to be to touch your birds for essential reasons. Just do it pro appropriately. Now, Donna, that's that's okay. It was more screaming. Right, so Donna, one second. Let's 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 get the screaming and the posturing and the posturing and the posturing. And the posturing. Oh goodness, you come in as well. Okay, here we go. Oh, dear. Let's just Get the out the way. Oh wow, we're big men, this big men and ladies. Wow, look at us, big birds. Look why you're nibbling me. You're so excited, aren't you? So excited to be saying hello to everyone. She, she, it looks like she's biting me. She's nibbling me. She I don't think she ever bites me really. Put a, put a blue heart in the comments if this noise is winding up your bird. <laughs> we have eight birds, Bowser. We have eight birds. Uh, six of them rescues as well, so that obviously makes them noisier and naughtier as well. Um, lots and lots of birds. He's a good boy. It's I wasn't I wasn't able to do this for ages with him. It just took like training because he knew that if I do, I, I never wet kiss him because that's gross. He knows. I, I, why did I start? I would start doing it with him so I could feel his keel bone. So the bone on the front. I like to kiss the front because it's the easiest way of like feeling if they're like big. I don't want to use the word the f word. They're big or skinny. Yeah, and we got we've got um I'm not I don't know if people get squeamish, but we have loads of inverts as well, like spiders and isopods and mantises as well. Although I haven't done a live stream on that channel. By the way, if you're interested in that sort of stuff, uh, go to my other channel, Spoodopods. I've got loads of videos on that sort of content as well. But yeah, let's go back on topic. So these guys are now out and about. So let's go back to the question. Where was the question? Donna's question. Any idea why my my cockatiel screams when I touch my hair? So is that consistent? Every time you touch your hair, your cockatiel screams. Is it when you're on there on your shoulder or in front of you? Um, because if they're on your shoulder, they might just get annoyed while you're doing it. A bit. If you give me some context as to why they do it, I can probably give you a better answer there. Yeah, I, a gaming headset is a good idea, Adara. I, I use my head. I use headphones a lot more than I used to now. I have a headset in here, and even though I couldn't really afford it, I bought a headset for the other room as well, just because I oh, was cheaper one though, cheapo one, just so I can get some peace and so the noises of my games don't get them excited because sometimes they get really wound up by it. Yes, as cockatiels do love to protest. So I'm just correcting my, my boys will protest and squeal for the least little thing. Washing when you fix your hair. Now, that's really interesting. What would you say to that? What was that? So Donna, Donna says that her cockatiel screams when she touches her hair. Uh, it's probably because it's um, fingers are coming towards them. And they no, but no, but it's anywhere in, in anywhere in the room. Apparently, okay. if it was if it was on the shoulder, that would be an easy answer. Well, there's always a reason for the hate. Yeah, so there is a reason. So um, if you want to go into a bit more of a deep dive on it, which I will in the next two minutes, then I'll just shut up and stop. <laughs> It could be your hands motions, like Sandra said, your hands moving around. Maybe he's associated that with something else. Maybe you touching your hair to him means something because um, in the past he's associated that with something. It's called high order conditioning where – how can I really briefly describe this? Um, suspicious, superstitious thinking. So your cockatiels associate this, touching your hair with something else that he doesn't like. So whenever you do this, that means something bad. So say, for example, you touched your hair a couple of times, coincidentally, when a crow was outside and it was screaming, that scared him. Now this triggers screaming. That's probably the most um, logical reasons to why he's doing it. How do you fix it? Um, getting used to it a little bit and desensitize him to it. So Jonas, thanks for answering my question. When he screams upside down, should we just um, leave him alone, ignore him? And when he screams, if he's screaming for hours, then obviously you can't ignore it. If you try, so generally you don't want to reinforce screaming and giving attention immediately because that just reinforces it and gives, increases the screaming. You need to work out, is there anything in the environment that's causing him to scream? Is there anything scary going on? Is there birds out the window? You know, are you doing something scary? 
And that's the first thing. Eliminate that. Uh, maybe keep a screaming diary so you can work out when he's doing it. If it's attention seeking, you what I'm gonna say, you can get rid of that through something called extinction, which basically means you ignore it consistently, but you're going to have to ignore it every single time and you're going to, have to ignore it for hours on end to get rid of that behavior. It's not advisable, it doesn't it does work, but it's not really practical and you may get reinforced by something else. So the best ways are normally fixing the environment. Uh, noting when it happens, reinforcing him when he's quiet. So try to reinforce alternate things, giving him more to do, like maybe foraging activities. He's a busy beak. He's a quiet beak. Looking at his diet, see if there's anything there, like a high sugar diet to cause the screaming. There's just so much to it. I'm, I'm sadly, Jonas. There's like literally, I can I can literally fill this whole chat with paragraphs. So my suggestion would be watch our videos on screaming. Try and implement what I've just said. If you have really struggle, book a consult with us in the future because then we can look into it in detail and give you like a proper plan for it. It's, it's too big a topic to just cover very quickly. So Adara, yes, something why you can, it's, it's the way with us humans. So for example, something bad happens to you when you're wearing a red t-shirt, you may never wear that red t-shirt again because you've superstitiously linked that red t-shirt to that bad thing happening. It's very common with us humans. As someone who has OCD, that's very common for me. And I have to be very mindful of it and very scientific in my thinking to try and stop that from happening. It's completely normal. What, 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 oh my goodness, I think almost my second topic and we're half an hour in. Which you were. So, any other questions just to catch up? Birds with Joanna, I have a bird under a year old, I'm fostering, it's reached a teenage. Uh, it's my first time with cockatiels, so I'm super interested about your experience with your boy cockatiels, they're teenager. Yes, we had them from babies. Oh, well, we got them when they were basically after they were weaned. Um, uh, I've got a video to explore that, so I'm just wasting time before I explain their backstory. So when they were teenagers, they were noisier. But to be honest, their terrible twos were pretty tame compared to a lot of cockatiels. <laughs> you can get some real anger issues. You can get biting. You can get humping of perches and all sorts of things. You seem to have in the background. <laughs> Um, again, it's the same hormone management techniques. Whatever happens, you just want to get the diet right and get through it. And once they get, once you get through it, the behavior tends to level out, and they'll just get more hormonal at certain times of the year. I'm looking at the opposite. Side so to fix my hair, I'm very clever. I'm not there's much left of it. Yeah. So manage the hormones. So what is what's this from Sandra? So Sandra said, hey, Don, even if he doesn't understand what you're saying, he will get the intent. My guy's an issue to wash the machine the next point because you have to reassure him. So your tone can be important, but I don't like to give that sort of advice generally, not to be um, raining in your parade there, Sandra. I don't mean to like be mean or anything, but they don't really understand what we have to say. They don't speak English. And over time, when you build a relationship, yes, certain tones will be calming and certain words may have associations. But I try not to advise people to do that because then they get this wrong impression that language means something to your bird. Yes, being loud means overstimulation. Being quiet generally means karma. You can use that, but I wouldn't go any further than that with regards to talking it. So, Smith, uh, people's an eye socket never, never nipped me. Um, I think the lightest I've had is a very gentle pinch on my bridge, but she doesn't really like to go in my eye socket very much these days. She tends to like to cuddle against the side of my head or against Sophie. It's sad for me because I really like it. It's relaxing for me. It's not good for her feathers, though. Not good for her feathers, exactly. So, you know, it's, it's good for her not to do it as much. Uh, Paula, uh, it's chip and fish are cockatiels. You can learn a lot about them on my channel. There's loads of stuff about them. They're pretty smart and pretty cute. I love them. Uh, Bowser, he's so cute. Yeah, Scampy is a bit of a showman and he's very food motivated. So he'll just keep going and going and going and offering behaviors. He's very keen. The only time he isn't keen is when he wants to explore something. So if he wants to go exploring, he will just take the treat from you and throw it on the floor. Like, I don't want it. No thanks. Right. So let's do the other topic. So, um, so yeah, it's very briefly. Uh, sorry, it's, oh yeah, sorry, Smith. Sorry, I'll, I'll cover that question in a moment. Just one second. Give me a little, a little while, and I'll just do that. So I want to get through my last topics. Then I'll have the rest of the twenty minutes, twenty-five minutes for questions and just birdie chaos. Um, I want to make a point about something. A video I'm going to be doing coming up. Um, a lot of the time. And I'm guilty of this because my view is kind of if you can't have a bird and, you know, then you shouldn't have a bird. You know, it's, But there is a human equation to things. When you get bitten, it hurts and it knocks back your confidence. We're, we're animals as well. We have to apply the same logic. I think it's very important to apply the same logic to us as we do our birds. We have to be compassionate to ourselves. If you have trouble with your bird, 
it's okay to feel bad about it, you know? It's okay that it's, it hurts you and it upsets you. Kipling with me upsets me what happened recently with me. It makes me feel like a poor trainer. It makes me feel uh, demotivated. It makes me initially not want to interact with him. Those feelings are completely normal. This is the important bit, though. It's coming back to that situation again and trying again. Because like of any relationship, it takes work. And if you want to maintain it, it's going to be ups and downs. So the human equation, I, I think it deserves its own video. So I'm going to do it, talking about how we feel and how important that is to everyone. But you have to go back. You have to get back on the horse. And you have to keep trying again because it's not their fault. We've got them in our, in our houses. You know, um, if ultimately you have to rehome because it's absolutely untenable, fine. But do investigate every option because often it just takes a little bit of um, research, a little bit of training, a little bit of time. And you can rebuild relationships. You can build positive relationships. It's about having that knowledge to do it as well. Reaching out to people, um, observing your bird and training. And I, I'm, I'm trying not to be preachy, you guys. Here, so apologies if it is. I'm trying to be more understanding than preachy, but it always comes across as preachy. It's just about, um, you know, trying. Keep trying is all I can say, really, because I understand it. A lot of people do it. And I think that's where me and Sophie kind of have an edge on other trainers because we've dealt with these situations in our, in our own house, you know, we don't just work at a zoo. We don't just fob the birds off or hide them and just say, right, off you go. Cause you can't, I can't train you. So it's the, it's the bird's fault. Shoot. We don't do any of that. And that's what, that's one thing I'm quite proud of of us because we're honest enough to do that. And it has made us better trainers because some of the situations we've dealt with, not only for us, but for clients, I was just looking at Sophie because she's nodding, but some of the situations we've dealt with, not only for ourselves, but for clients, our situations, other trainers have just not resolved. And we've, being like the last line of defense for that bird gets rehomed or back in the rescue system. So be compassionate to yourself, keep trying and do reach out for advice and help if you need it. We do have a business and you don't have to use it. You can just use resources online, but just keep trying. And you can touch our upcoming course. And yeah, we've got the bonding course as well, which talks about some of these topics in more depth. And also, um, I, I suppose I should mention it. Basically, on I'm going to be doing a course on, on functional assessment. Again, more technicalities. It's basically assessing problem behaviours in a scientific, proven behavioural scientific method and resolving them in that way. I'll be doing a course on that. I'll also be doing a Patreon video and down the line I'll be doing a brief YouTube video on it. But I know it's very jargon heavy, which is why I haven't put it on YouTube yet because for some people it's just like blah, 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 blah. And it's just words. <laughs> and I don't like to be that guy. When I taught in the past, I hated to do that. I wanted my students to understand what I was saying. I like people to understand technical. So in the course, I'm going to I'll talk through all these technical terms and in great detail. Everything else, I'll try and present it in a much more um, friendly manner. Just another digression. So, Smitter, sorry. Let's go back to Smitter's question. So extra sensitive toothbrush, can it be used for brushing head feathers, holding a bird, holding a bird same as toweling? So there's... Sorry, can, is there two questions there. So let's do the first one. Yes, you could use a toothbrush if they're, they're okay with it. Um, it depends if it's really necessary. Some I've seen a couple of people do that, but is it needed? You know, you could just, are you doing it for preening or are you doing it to get molt out? Are you doing it just to pet them? If it's for petting, it's fine. You can just use your hand otherwise. Um, brushing head. Oh, sorry, now I understand the second question. Now. I'll do that in a second as well. So yeah, you can use it. Completely fine to be very gentle with it. You press, put any pressure down, it could cause damage to skin follicles or cause issue, even tear hairs out. So very gentle with it. So it's holding the bird the same as toweling. Now, um, both situations, you may have that situation where it occurs in an emergency, but me and Sophie prefer to do um, voluntary husbandry. So say, for example, you need to towel your bird and toweling or holding a bird should never be done for punishment and restraint should be a necessary thing only in emergencies or for absolutely essential stuff, not just as a, I'm gonna restrain my bird. I've done videos on it in the past, um, I won't go into that. So holding a bird is kind of the same as toweling. Um, you have to be very careful in both ways. You have to restrain your bird in a very special way. If you don't, then you could risk harming them or injuring them, or if they struggle, you could risk much worse. Um, so yes, make sure you know how to hold a bird and how to towel if you have to. For example, a lot of people find they have to towel their bird for um, nail trimming. But again, investigate the voluntary ways. We train our birds to voluntarily have their nails trimmed through the bars. We want to get one of those little um, is it drill? It's like a dremel. dremel things so we can do it through the bars. A lot of people have success with that. It's a lot less invasive and it's a lot quicker. You can positively pair it. Positive reinforcement is the go-to. You want to be restraining as a last resort. And that is generally the scientific consensus on this. It's not just my word for it. Um, unless you talk to a, a trainer that's living in 1950, that's generally what people would go to. 
Um, but as a caveat, I have taught pickles to be held. I wonder if you're, yeah, we'll try. So, Smith, I'll try and demonstrate because I have got a way of holding pickles, but I do it in a very special way and it's trained. It's I don't grab her. It's not the way to towel the restraint. Yeah, this isn't this isn't a formal restraint, restraint or toweling method. This is just the way that pickles will restrict. I wonder if you can sort of pick them up and just hold them. Pickles, so, I'm holding pickles there. Little protest there because she wants a snack, so I'm not reinforcing her. So that is the only way I will I will hold my bird. So if I can try and demonstrate it, you know. Oh, is that why she's whingy? Yeah. I don't want to force her. You see. Does she want to? I don't think she wants to. So that's not a good. So basically, what what I do is I get people. To, she's too excited. That's why. Get your foot up on there. There we go. So I let Pickles voluntarily step up onto my hand and I support her feet so she doesn't feel like she's been grabbed by me. There's also no pressure on her back as well to avoid the hormonal side. That's the only way I do it. Uh, birds with Joanna. Sorry, I hope that answers the question. So when you say manage the hormones, does it help with cockatiels that have reached teenage just recently? Of course, definitely, 100%. Um, you know, be patient. You have to be patient, but you can manage hormones. It's really important. So Klaus, don't you think that birds react to their names and should could be considered a hundred percent? They there's a lot of research to say that there are rudimentary forms of language in animals. We're just too arrogant to see them, and that's through association. So, for example, if I shout "scampy, scampy," he knows that means go back there. But that's done over time. That's why I don't tell a, a new person to train him to say your bird's going to know its name, your bird's going to react to no, your bird's going to react to whatever else immediately. Yeah, I was also going to say that he doesn't know that scampy is his name. He knows that scampy, scampy means he needs to fly to the station or for example, fish, you would say, oh, he knows his name. What it actually means is he looks at us for um, a <laughs> prompt. So it's not that they understand the language as such. It's more, it's... it's well, reinforce the truth. <laughs> um, it's a prompt for something else. They don't know exactly what it means. They means it, um, They know it means a behaviour or that reinforcement is coming. So that's basically why I would say they have a... a... Scam. Why are you misbehaving? Why are you beaking? He's not having reinforcement for beaking me. Wow. Well, he didn't bite me, but that wasn't exactly what I wanted to see there. So overexcited. Yeah, they're just a bit overexcited. That's that's a bit confusing because he normally like flips yeah, immediately. I think he got excited by the screen. So. Oh, scam. Oh, I, I probably know that as well. You stole the whole almond, didn't you? Oh yeah. So he's not exactly satiated. He's satiated. <laughs> um, really? We also appreciate like the quiet right now. Yeah, it's that all nice and quiet. Nice. <laughs> oh yeah, Adara, avian teas are really helpful, really useful. What, what? Sorry, I can't even pronounce that. I know what it is. Can you look at this, please? How do you? How on earth do you pronounce that? Be it's Beatrix. Uh, Beatrix's question. Echinacea. Yeah, echinacea. Sorry, I'll echinacea tea. Um, I don't have. I don't know. So echinacea you can answer that one. Safe for birds, um, but it's usually better offered as part of a blend rather than just having it straight up. There you go. I had no idea about that. Um, I know a lot about teas, but not that particular one. So yeah, do it as a part of a blend. Um, there's loads of other really good blends or individuals you can offer. Like uh, chamomile is really good. Tulsi is really good. Yeah, exactly. Clay, Clay Gill, if exactly you, you put that time in and it works. There are happy stories at the end. It's just effort and consistency and time. And in the end, you'll get there. Like for Scampi is another great example. When he hated me when he first came, he used to bite me continuously. I know that wasn't the best example in beating me on, on live on camera. Right. But even then, it wasn't he wasn't biting me, you know, he was just pinching me because he wanted something. So well, Dara, when I give a bird a cue to fly to me or spin, they don't understand that word means the thing exactly. They just associate it with a trained behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically. But then isn't it the same for us? Don't we learn in exactly the same way? We learn, um, I suppose it's a bit more advanced for us. Let's let's try and separate two things like names. We, we have a central identity, which you could argue a bird may have, but we haven't investigated. Science hasn't gone that far yet. But yes, we learn that um, if we scream, we get food when we're a baby. We learn that if we touch a hot stove, we pull our hand away. Those, those are all behaviours you learn. And oh God, another operant and respondent. I'm not going to go into that again. So let's not go into that topic. Behaviour either increases or decreases in frequency. No, 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 no. That's not it. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the difference between respondent and operant. That's the whole other life. Yeah, so that's why. That's, that's a live stream on its own. How do I know if my cockatiel loves me or not? Um, that they want to spend time with you. They're happy being with you. And love's a, an interesting word because I don't want to say my boys love me. They love. They like being around me. They enjoy me. We're we're. I'm part of the flock. But love's an interesting word to use. 
Yeah, parrots and wolves, that's uh, important. We aren't just trainers. You know, we have birds here and we work with them all the time. You know, we sort of live in the middle of, of it all, which puts us in a really dodgy place for getting a lot of flack, but also a really useful place for actually helping the most. Right, so but so birds with Joanna, when it comes to adjusting diet, I've read conflicting advice, reducing seed or reducing fresh foods. So reducing fresh foods is rubbish, honestly, for dealing with hormones. The only caveat to that is if your food's consistently mushy and the texture's bad, like when you have frozen chop, that can simulate regurgitated food. So that can cause trouble with um, your bird simulating regurgitated for hormones. Fresh chop, don't reduce that. Look, look at balance in your diet. I mean, again, this is another 20-minute topic. So briefly, watch our channels, have a look at the stuff we've talked about. And um, think about reducing high fat stuff and making your bird exhibit um, behavior, natural behaviors like foraging to get stuff. Uh, there's a lot of bad information out there, lots of diversity, exactly. Well, birds of China, you know, it, it can take time, it can be difficult. We try to see hormones as like a puzzle. Hormones are like a label and you have loads of bits and pieces. You have to start taking bits of the puzzle out, then eventually it sort of starts to mitigate a little bit. Smitha, thank you very much. That's very kind. You're the first one for today. Very, very kind of you. Thank you very much. So birds of Janet, it will be worse. That That is the truth. It is consistently worse during those years. I wouldn't say there's nothing you can do. Even just doing training to try and get them to do other stuff rather than exhibiting more like um, territorial behaviours, etc. Again, another label would help, honestly. So, Paula, I did at the right at the start of the live stream. Sadly, I can't do it again because these two are out and I don't want a uh, chaos if something happens because it's chaotic enough during these live streams. If you want to see the birds' tricks, I've got uh, Instagram with loads of stuff. I've got loads of videos of it on there. Yeah, uh, the hormone teeth can make such a big difference. We use them as well, and they do have a mitigating impact on stuff. It's really useful. Uh, so I've got a couple of questions. I've, I'm going to be live for another 15 minutes approximately. I've got two questions that were sort of pre-sent in. Uh, the first is it different having two birds rather than one? I know someone asked that in my comments recently, but I also had it on Instagram, so I thought I'd um, talk through that briefly. Is it different having two birds rather than one? Uh, double the mess, a little bit more effort, but a lot of the things are quite similar. And in some ways, you know, some people say it's double the screaming, but to an extent, but also that bird's going to have a companion of its own. So it'll be less screaming in that they'll be happy being with their own instead of screaming for you because they have someone of their own flock to spend time with. So there is, it does make, I don't think husbandry wise, it's very similar. You just need to duplicate bowls, have plenty of toys, have a bit of extra space. And it's just quite interesting, really. So I don't think there's much difference in it. And then, yeah, oh, sorry. No, I, was sorry. Say, I think that's a lot of people get put off by having a second bird because they think it's going to be loads more work. And unless there's behavioural issues, it's not really. Exactly. <laughs> So birds with Joanna, there's loads of hormonal teas depending on where you are in the world. Um, if you're in the UK, Polly's Natural Parrot Boutique. If you're in the US, China Prairie or Bio Bird Blends, they're both really good. Uh, if you're elsewhere in the world, uh, you have to ask Sophie. <laughs> uh, last question before, it's just the free for all for the last 10 minutes, is why do I have no videos on breeding on my channel? I, I'm not a breeder. I can offer some basic husbandry advice to people, but I'm not going to give people advice on breeding birds at home. I think there's enough in the system already. There's enough ethical breeders there already. I am not the person to go to for that advice. That's why I don't have videos on breeding, purely because it's not something I feel the uh, best place to give advice on. Beyond if there's an emergency situation, I'll give the most basic advice and then refer to someone with more knowledge. We are trainers. We're not breeders. We have a lot of knowledge on basic anatomy or you know diet, um, you know training stuff, etc. Husbandry, but breeding is not our speciality. So no, not at all, Paula. I mean, we want to try and shout out everyone, give everyone attention when they um, sort of join our lives because we are well. We really appreciate everyone who sort of gives gives us the attention, really, and comes on these lives to talk to us, and interact with us. It's important to us to um, build a good relationship with everyone, and we want to help the most people we can while still actually being able to survive as well. So. You know, it's just good, and we appreciate any support. You know, sharing our videos around, talking to people is great. Oh, you've enjoyed, have you enjoyed it that much, Mr. Teeny? It's been 55 minutes. So, Cindy, that's a myth. Um, they tend not to bond with you if you have more than one. Um, basically, it's a really old school myth. The I don't know where it even came from. I don't know if it was just laziness or it's just something that people said, and people were like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's true, because one bird runs away from the other or whatever. The only situation that's like, is uh, sorry that was bad English. The situation that really occurs is when you have a hormonal pair and that person doesn't put any effort into training the birds. We have multiple bonded pairs and we got them separated together and there's no issues really, apart from obviously the, the kidney situation. 
But, you know, even that improved massively before we just went to, to pot, which I explained on Patreon. So, yeah, it's a bit of a myth. Um, so they do go to the bathroom an awful lot. You may not notice it. Um, pickles, often when they're settled, they tend to go to the bathroom less. So when Pickles is up there, she'll often last 20 minutes before she'll go. They're focused, they'll go less. But generally, they do go an awful lot. Um, when they're focused on something, that tends to be a little bit less frequent. And also my perch, me as the perch, she doesn't want to foul me up. So that's why she's leaving me alone. Scabby doesn't tend to like going on me either. Are you going to come over here? Are you going to make up for earlier or are you on the opposite? Oh, I keep getting confused between the soils. <laughs> He's Are you going to wait for me? We're going to make up for what you, are you not full anymore? There we go. That's, this is more like what he's like with me. I don't know, what was, well. I don't know what was happening earlier. No. You've been mean to me, weren't you? Hmm? It's a label. <laughs> yeah, it's a label being mean. I have to do a video on that at some point as well. Do you so want to go to mummy? Lazy, stubborn, yeah. tame, nice, polite, friendly. They're all ladies. <laughs> Don't mean just wipe, I'm, I'm just like wiping away from me. <laughs> yeah, Sandra, he doesn't want to go on you. These guys prefer to just go on my hand and then go. He was feeling like a big boss, man. I'm just glad he doesn't bite me anymore. My goodness, that was uh, difficult at the start. A beaking, you know, everyone, it just happens. But uh, biting is never fun. Pickles very red, does it? So um, that's all my questions done. If you guys have any questions you want to fire away, now's the time. Last 10 minutes of the live. Uh, anything you want to see with these guys. I can't get the other ones out, I'm afraid. These guys have been out for, what, 25 minutes now? I suppose the boys could come out to do some behaviours. If they want to. They, they, may, they may be a bit fussy as well. Yeah. yeah, so if you want to see anything with these guys or um, you want some more sort of questions, just let me know. Um, I'll, could do, I'll yeah, we'll do some live recall if they're in the mood. Can you come off? We'll try to do some live recall. Why not? It's good fun. I'll try and do it sideways as well so you can actually see her flying. I thought you were going to do it all the way backwards, so... Uh-oh. Scampy's on the map. Scampy wants to do it. Scampy. Scampy. That was a good, a good shot, wasn't it? Shaky cam. You want to take him because Pickles is going to chase him. Okay. Oh, sorry. He says no. Right, so you want to go on my shoulder as well. <laughs> That's the problem with managing two birds with training. So what? normally we'd have it set up so there was two perches, but because I've got this live on, I can't do it normally. I'll train my Sophie will do some training and I'll do Pickles in front of this. Pickles me. Good girl. So small. We try to station. So someone asked a question recently as well. What's the difference between throwing your bird and just cueing them? That is not throwing. I just tilted my hand with people's nose. I don't really want to show, in fact, I'm not going to show it because we, we don't like showing bad examples. So literally throwing would be like lowering it so people's had to take off or literally chucking her. Those aren't good training methods. Those will result in uh, decreased trust in this. And I want increased trust in it. Pickles me. Pickles me. Good girl. Yeah. We'll try and do something on a level now. Yeah, Scampy's really keen now. He's, 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 um, his nuts gone through his crop, so he wants to try <laughs> So when you're doing these as well, these sessions, make sure you do them higher, lower as well, so you get your bird used to different um, types of flight, ascent, descent on the level, because it will improve their flight, it will give them more tools more when they get stuck somewhere, and be more motivated to fly to you. One more time. Oh, there, people just went, live on camera. Yeah. Your kid is just free. <laughs> it's a bad habit I've got into. Confusing yeah. behaviours as well. You want to do one, we'll do one more equal your key for it. Do a nice buy one. Pick up me. Pick up me. Scampy. Scampy's come over. Scampy. Or you one high one out of those pickles, please. You know what? You, Mummy's got treats for you. Yes. He's got a good boy. Pick up me. Pick up me. Pick up me. Is it too high? Is it too steep? Pick up me. It's too high for pickles, P. Oh, little pickles. Little pickles. Spin. Okay. What good girl you are. You're not finished eating. You, uh, that was bad training for me there. She wasn't finished eating, I was queuing her. Spin. So it's a good example of not, not, what not to do. Wait for them to finish, then do it. Easily done. Well, when you finish that, well, you can just come to me when you're ready. Uh, he's always a big boss man. <laughs> so that's an interesting first word to learn, Sandra. 
So out of, uh, do your birds take turns flying in the apartment? Um, so yes, basically, this is a question we get asked an awful lot. And we would like the birds all out at the same time. Um, there's probably enough space for it, but because this is our living room and because a lot of the birds are rescued, they don't get on very well with each other. We can have pickles and the boys out at the same time, probably scampi as well, but I won't do it on a live. It's, just, it's, not, it's too much for me to manage, basically. I can't like talk to you and do that. That's why you never see them out together during lives. But um, we can have Olive out with the boys. There's loads of different social dynamics. If we had a lot more space, we would probably do it, but it's just there's the restrictions we have here, basically. Yeah, any kind of videos or yeah, when it's filming, we won't do it basically because there's too much chaos. We have yeah, we have loads of videos, Paula, on stepping up. We it's an essential skill. My new coin is. Uh, my, okay. You're going to stand here, sorry. My my new coin steps up, but it's hard to get into. I've tried so many tricks, nothing works. Well, Paul, that um, literally what I just did, but in smaller steps. So you put your hand. Let's here. So there's pickles. You put your hand a little bit further away, and you encourage her to hop to it, give her a reinforcement, then gradually increase the distance until she's flying to you. Um, I, it's a shame you didn't. I didn't see that question when I was actually doing it. I could have showed you live, but I'm running out of time here. So cockatiel lover, any tips? My new queen steps up the heart. So. Nothing works. So look at how you're presenting your hand. Go back to basics on stepping up. Um, I, I need to know a lot more context to that. You know, what treats you're using? Have you done treat hierarchy tests with them? They're just screaming. So basically, fish has decided to scream at Chip because Chip he wants Chip's attention. Chip doesn't want it, and that's why we get the screaming here. Normally, it goes on for about a minute or two, and then they stop. But I obviously, can't have that during a live, so I can't. I can't hear myself think. Oh, the, so the, sorry, the whistle I'm doing there is, is I'm trying to um, encourage him to do a different sound. So when he screams like that, the, the quickest way normally to get him to stop is by sort of uh, acknowledging him with a, another whistle, which is woo, 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 woo. Then he starts doing that, which is a lot quieter and it's a lot less, a lot more tolerable, less intrusive. It's basically reinforcing something different from him rather than what I don't want, which is the loud screaming. Thank you very much, Smith. It's very kind of you. Thank you. I think I actually like it. Why won't it let me like it? Oh, there we go. I can like it there. Thank you very much very kind um so yeah um we do try uh, there is a limit to it obviously we get tired as well we're only human as i talked about earlier in this sort of session but yeah we try our best honestly to help as many people as we can um there was something i was gonna talk about but it's kind of like doom and gloom a little bit like because i get a lot of messages on instagram and people sort of feel almost entitled to advice now and I, that rubs me up the wrong way it's like people don't have to give me money people don't have to watch my channel people don't have any obligations to talk to me but it's, it goes the same the other way around and i've had a lot of instagram messages where like they're demanding my attention immediately it's like come on guys you know i don't have that the other way around you know thank you very much Adara. it's very kind of you thank you i don't know why it won't let me click like i think it's just for viewers maybe but it lets me love it as well so Bowser, yes you can these guys know songs from video from video games they know a uh, football chant as well do we ever hear it on camera? No, <laughs> not very often. We do film it like when it's normal, but they very rarely do it when I'm live streaming. They do sing songs. There are much more talented cockatiels out there for singing, but our boys are just really good at tricks. Yeah, so so um, it's about reinforcing something different. So basically with these guys, how we started with that, we'd wait for fish to be quiet, then I'd do the other sound, then I'd reinforce that via my attention or the treat, then he would do that. Now I just have to make that sound and he will just do that instead. That's the easiest way of doing it. But anyway, guys, it's last, like, oh, by me, thank you very much, Iris. It's very kind of you as well. It's like last minute people are like being, being very kind. Where do I do? There we go. I'll, I'll click the little thingy. Oh, blimey. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. I was going to say, the last couple of minutes now, so any last minute questions, um, I'm happy to answer and help out. Thank you very much, Iris. Thank you very much, Lesson More Vulture. It's very kind of you. Um, if not, no more questions or whatever. I'll start wrapping things up in a minute or so. Do you see pickles? Look at her. Look how fluffy. It's funny as well because the other conyers, if they're out right now, they'll be getting so overstimulated, just like Scampi was towards the middle. But she, I'm talking loudly, you know, she's decent to it. She just sits there and relax, it relaxes, even though I'm talking so loudly. It's really oh, cute nice. to see by me. People are being like really generous at the end. Thank you very much, Clay Gill, as well. It's very kind of you. I like the little emoji. Is that like a, a hippopotamus? I've never seen that one before. Thank you. But yeah, it's so nice that she's just so calm during these live streams. If only the rest of them would be so calm. And I think in some ways, 
Pickle's nose when I'm live streaming. That's why she started yelling. She was like, I want to come out. She gets excited. She gets excited. She, gets she knows I'm going to come out and get treats. I'm going to sit up there. And everyone's going to like, <laughs> give me attention. Scampi's just drinking in the background as well. He's just having a drink. He's walking up all the crumbs from the snacks down here. He's a really boy. Thank you, Birds of Jenna. Um, no problems. Again, that's, what, that's our, basically our job. We want to make the best impact we can, help most people we can. Um, just as a roundup, sort of, I'll best start finishing it now. Thank you all for joining us. We will have a course coming out very soon. Um, we've, it's been delayed by loads of stuff due to exams and my my own studies. Uh, it's going to be on building a bond with your bird and dealing with problem behaviors. We've got another one on ABCs coming when I actually have time to plan it and film it. Loads more videos coming. We've got loads of stuff pre-filmed because I will probably not be able to film coming up for a period. Loads of stuff going on. I'd like to, yet yeah, do feel free to join either channel members or Patreon because you get access to our Discord server where you can ask questions all the time and you get access to exclusive videos, discounts on courses, blah, 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 all the spiel there. It's well worth joining. People seem to appreciate it. But I best wrap this up. Thanks very much, all of you, for joining us. Thank you very much for all the kind uh, donations. Thank you all very much for your kind attention and comments. It's very much appreciated. I hope all of you have a really nice weekend and take Smitter, naughty right at the last moment. Thank you very much. Uh, take care, everyone, and have a really, really nice rest of your day. See you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>